So right through, I kept teaching myself to write in a Canada which was not my own. You know? And right through, there were people, as I succeeded, there were people snapping at me saying, Girish doesn't know how to write Canada. Welcome to The River Has No Fear of Memories, a series of conversations with Girish Karnad. This podcast is brought to you by the Bangalore International Center, and my name is Arshia. We recorded these conversations with Girish right before his death in June 2019. In these episodes, we have a chance to listen to Girish's wide-ranging observations about his life and his work. Along with excerpts from his plays, we'll hear various people talk about his legacy as an artist and as a public intellectual. The great explosion was this, this his journal, which brought all arts together. You know, writing, writers, caste, problems, everything. <laughs> and at a very sophisticated level. He was our best editor. I mean, closing of the Desha Kala was a tragedy for Kannada literature. Girish is talking about Vivek Shanbag, writer, critic, editor, publisher of new writing, and truly one of the most engaged and important people in contemporary Kannada literature. In this episode, you will hear Girish and Vivek in conversation and Vivek and myself revisit that conversation. So Vivek, you've known Girish for a long time. He admired you and he regarded you as a peer. But when did you meet Girish and what kind of relationship did you share over the decades? Frankly, I can't recall when I uh, came to know of him because my, uh, he was my mother's classmate. <laughs> And my mother had told me about him because he was, you know, when I was uh, growing up or when I was very young, he was already a very well-known figure. In me. So later on, uh, of course, I, I met him. No, I can't even recall when I met him <laughs> for the first time. And later on, I feel that we became closer when he moved to London, when I also moved to London. This was in year 2000. Till then, of course, we have been interacting, but that kind of closeness uh, was not there till then. And I must say, after that, uh, I was probably the first reader of uh, everything that he wrote uh, from that time onwards. He shared uh, his uh, manuscripts with me, and I was, uh, and I admired him a lot for many, many things. And one of that was uh, his ability to take criticism and uh, engage with me, though I was much younger to him. And, uh, and, and he, he would take it seriously and not hold that uh, my view or my criticism uh, against me. And that never affected our personal relationship. There were many uh, instances where I have fought with him very bitterly, but he has never you know, held it uh, against me. And I, I really respect him for that because that quality is something which I don't see with uh, many people uh, around. Do you want to tell us about one instance where you disagreed with each other or had an animated discussion, shall we say? Uh, one of the things uh, which I can recall is uh, the arguments that we have had on why he got into writing contemporary plays much later in his life. One of Girish's earliest works is Anjum Malige, a play set in 1960s London. But Girish is better known for his historical, mythological and folk plays. So he didn't really start writing contemporary plays until the early 2000s about the world around him, the world in which he lived. 
Anju Mallige plays a very important role in his writing because that is the first time he tried something contemporary. In his own uh, view, he does not think that it is a very uh, successful play. So I asked him why did it take so long for him to write a contemporary play, whether he feared failure. Because I didn't really know. All through, I kept saying, I must write a play in a contemporary uh, theme. But I didn't know how to do it. I thought it was very difficult. It, you, know, it, it was, you, you know, you could look at Chekhov. Yeah. You could look at Ibsen. You know, Ibsen had a theme, some secret in the past. Chekhov was there, you know, that kind of thing. Without using that kind of a, this, uh, you know, can one write with, with, no, with a, no, a normalness, you know, of a modern society, like, like as is my favorite play, Streetcar Named Desire. But even people like uh, Sriranga mm. found it risky, mm. really to genuinely write about their own society. Mm. Look what happens in Harijan. Mm. In Harijan, one of the critical things is a woman comes and she wants to be a cook. And she is taken as a cook in a Brahmin household. Mm. And the, the boy of the family wants to marry. And it transpires at the end that she is a Dalit. Mm. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine a Dalit woman walking in and working in a kitchen? Would she know the kind of, forget whether the prejudices, would, they, would she know what kind of food we want? You know, so that kind of problem was completely brushed aside. Girish would keep coming back to Sri Ranga and to this play Hari Janwara. I think because he was really interested in the kind of social realism that Sri Ranga was attempting. You told me, Vivek, that Girish wrote a critical essay about this play. Yeah, Girish wrote a critical essay on Hari Janwara, Sri Ranga's play, and it in a way tells us Girish's stance on contemporary themes. By the time uh, he had written this article, Sri Ranga had already reviewed his book, uh, Yayati. And if I remember right, he, Girish had already written Tughlaq. So Girish, by that time, was more confident about uh, responding to Sri Ranga. Because Sri Ranga is one of the most important playwrights of that time. And I don't think Girish has responded to anyone else other than Sri Ranga. He does not even consider others as you know, playwrights worthy of uh, response. You see, the problem ultimately, as I wrote in Hari uh, uh, these people was the, all their plays, yes. what they call social plays, had a living room. Okay. And they sat. And visitors came. They came and they came and they argued and the visitors went. And these are all good early, late 19th century houses. But the point is, a good 19th century house in Dharwa doesn't have a, li li a living room. You know, it has a room where you receive guests. You know, you give them tea. But you would never discuss a family problem there. You know, family problems are discussed inside. You know, husband and wife discuss, discuss different kinds of problems. You know, then a, a wife would put forward her opinion only over uh, when lunch is being served, you know, when she has authority, not in front of guests, you know. So I said that the whole geography of the house that they assume is wrong. You know, this would never happen. No, I, I'm not talking of modern houses. I mean, of the talk of the talk of 1950s, 60s, Dharwad houses. You know, people, women, actually women, Saraswati and Gaur Saraswati women actually used to come and sit and talk with guests. In other communities, they wouldn't even come and sit. They would stand behind a door and, you know, so this whole notion that you just sat together in a living room and discuss family problems was false. You know, borrowed from... I love the fact that he uses the word geography and not architecture when he's talking about the house, as if there's something natural about those spaces. But as far as Girish was concerned, Sri Ranga and his contemporaries had just borrowed this living room from Ibsen and Chekhov and stuck it into the middle of a Kannada play. 
But Vivek, you weren't happy with his answer. You kept asking him about the risks involved in writing a truly contemporary play. What were you getting at? I was telling him that because you did not live for in, in Karnataka for long enough, or you probably did not have enough exposure to the problems here or the Dalit issue or anything. Hence, you have not been able to pick up a theme, which is a contemporary theme. And I said, because you are, you are so, your intellect is so intense and your ideas are so strong that you are, you are idea driven and you are looking for a body to place those uh, ideas. Nothing wrong in it. It's just the way, uh, you know, each uh, creative writer approaches uh, certain things. So we were talking about it and, and it is a very strong criticism about why he did not or did. And I was always saying Manju, Anju Maliki you could do because there is no risk because you are talking about some other society. But you can't say anything in, in Karnataka. But the moment you, you give a name to your character, there is a caste to it. And then there is a language, then there is food, then everything. You, you just can't escape it. Okay, I want to say two things. First of all, that's a great point about how name is caste in India. But I'm going to push back a little on Girish not being able to write a contemporary play because he didn't live in Karnataka for long enough. Vivek, that evening, he said that going away helped him see his society more clearly. I think that for Girish, realism lay in finding a plausible situation, a microcosm that could reflect what was happening in society. A family wedding, like Mother Way album, is perfect for something like that. I couldn't get a form at all. How do you tell a story about, you see, by contemporary theme, I always knew that I had to write about Saraswats, because that's the reality I knew. It's no use of me writing out Lingais. How to write it? What, what do you do? There's so many things I know, I mean, you know. And it's only when I went to England, saw a place there, and came back, and saw again what was happening in my house, I think that I said, yes, this is probably how we'll do. Certainly, I had to shed uh, my uh, inhibitions about section, you know. This kind of uh, thing, you know, I would no, not have been able to handle earlier. Then I had to, of course, have got married to Saras and so the whole thing li- liberalized. Oh, the, the point is that. When you write, people don't, when people write social plays about their society, they are not honest. Mm. You know, they, they hide facts. They hide facts that may actually, you know, show their community in a bad light. You know, and they are, in uh, Madhuri album, mm. that girl goes to that uh, cafe. Yeah, internet the, cafe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the cyber cafe and talks to that uh, ghost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You don't know how many Saraswats are upset by that scene. <laughs> Saraswat girl won't do that. I said, why shouldn't she do it? No, she should do it. My family has refused to comment on that part of it. <laughs> because it's about my sister's wedding. You no, know, that play has caused a lot of, uh, of, you know, this in my family. Because some of the notions in it that uh, the mother, mother of the familiar, probably had an affair with the, whether he yeah. did, did have or not, we don't it's know. Not here. Yeah. It's not here, yeah. but my mother, fortunately, had written that autobiography of hers. You, you read it, yeah? In which she openly acknowledges about, you know, she lived with her, my father for five years. So I had the courage to put that in my, otherwise it wouldn't be, you know, I would be, stoned in public. To admit of the sexuality of one's mother itself would be horrifying. I think it's really quite endearing what he says about his inhibitions, you know, given that he seems so fearless. What do you think of that, Vivek? Do you think he's shed his inhibitions for Madhuvay album? See, one of the responses that Girish had uh, given to GB for his accusation or for when he said you will become Kare Natakakara is to say that, look, uh, contemporary sensibility is important and not the contemporary theme. And I, and I agree with uh, Girish in that because it's uh, it certainly, otherwise we would not have enjoyed Shakespeare today. But coming back to his contemporary uh, plays 
and his comment on shedding inhibitions. I feel that it is uh, when he was writing Tughlaq or Hayavadana or, or you know, other historical place or Nagamandala, all these things were outside of him. You know, they were placed in a certain context. They, he could do anything with them. He could do anything with Devadatta and Padmini and, and, and Kapila. But when he took up Madhwe album and as he said in his interviews, that it was him, it was his own thing. And he was certainly, you know, suddenly he was worried about how will this be seen as. Usually a writer in his younger days faces this problem because, you know, you, you are worried about what your mother says or wife or society because you are you are writing about things and then it it is something that one has to shed and uh, come out of it and it happens in in the process so i'm really surprised by his comment that you know he took so long for him so which means he is really in that sense he was writing a contemporary play one would not even think that girish will uh, you know will need to shed his inhibitions to write a play like uh, Madhubai album, yeah. but he has, yeah. and he has also talked about the responses that he has received to the play. And I think it's a, it's, it gives a wonderful insight into his creative process. Let's go to Wedding Album, published in English in 2009. Iravati Karnik is Radhabai, Lekha Naidu is the mother, Deepika Arvind is Vidula, and Maitri Surendra is Hema. There's nothing wrong with my hearing, Ma, I heard you. But can't you see how small these Trifala nuts are? I've been cooking since I was 10. You think I don't know my measurements? Please don't start again on your cooking expertise. I don't have the time. I have told you clearly, show me the amount before you put it in the masala. But that's simply too demeaning for you, isn't it? You are just too vain. Honestly, I tell you. Again? This is the third time today. We are used to it. Okay. Why don't you take over the whole business of cooking, Ma? You've hired me to cook for you and I feel a fool being told every little detail. Hey, this much vagar, this much salt, this much chilli powder, like to a child. Ah, if I am to come and slave in the kitchen, why do I need you here? Huh? Go, go and sit in that corner. Just collect your salary while I do your chores. Yes, I'll do just that. We must have been arch enemies in some past life, so I'm paying for it now. God broke this forehead of mine and took away my husband also. Even he has no pity on me. So I've got to live in your house and take whatever humiliations you pile on me. What's this new avatara, Vidu? She was never like this before. I know Ma has a temper, but Radha Bhai, she used to be so docile, so quiet. This has been going on for at least six months now. Listen, if you are going to shout and scream like this, you, you pack your bags and go back to your brother's place. Go! Huh? I'll arrange for the tickets. What? What will I do there? The four paise I've saved here will go into his pocket and then he'll throw me out again. I would rather lie down in a corner here and starve to death. What is wrong with Ma? Has she gone mad? Threatening to send Radha Bai away a week before the big do? For a trifla nut? Nothing will happen. Don't worry. Ma won't send her away. Radha Bai won't leave. But the squabbling goes on every day. So surprising. I mean, all these seven years, I've never heard her raise her voice. And this time, suddenly, I find her shouting and bashing her forehead like a harridan. What's gone wrong? I don't want you whimpering in a corner. No. No, 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 no. You had better go. Leave. Okay. If you say so, Ma, you're the mistress here. Who am I to say anything? Enough! Ma! Radha Bhai, please stop it. Enough now. What have I done, Hema? What did I say? She keeps asking me to go away. Go away where? I can't go from house to house asking for a job now, not at my age. No one is asking you to leave. Now you go into the backyard and cool your top. That's all that remains for me to do now. Sit down, place a beetle leaf on my head and do penance under the jackfruit tree. You can tell, no Vivek, that there's a Konkani inflection in Madhwe album. 
there are many places where you can see that that usage is not there in Canada. Ah, so for example, so one of the things that I that I uh, mentioned to him is in that uh, conversation was eleven lakhe. Eleven lakhe is a very Cockney thing, which is which equivalent of that is na mani chagera, which means uh, it, it's a negative of negative in in Madhuva album. It's about Cockneyness. It is not about these phrases or this or that. because you you can see see most of the konkanis they are obsessed with food <laughs> <laughs> and and i know that with this community people can go for miles and miles to get one herb yeah you know they are so obsessed with 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 food so that is that you can see that thing here and also in bangalore beans in some parts vivek what do you think is girish's natural language i mean between us we always uh, spoken with each other in konkani and english and i spoke to him in konkani in in singular mm. and uh, that is never possible in kannada i could i can't speak to him in in singular in kannada that would come out of my mouth you know he was uh, so much uh, older to me and you know uh, the point i'm making is the language allows you gives you certain mm. uh, freedom and uh, create certain space it is that in that context that i was asking him uh, when he uh, chose a language for a for a play was there a natural language mm-hmm. like kambar for example or lankesh they had they had they or anathmur they used there there is a language you can you can you can make out that it is kambar's language you can't say what is girish's mm-hmm. language because in taledanda he uses one in madhuve album there is something else in bimba there is something else in tugluk there is a very formal kannada in yayati it is something else because mm-hmm. you know it was also edited by someone else uh, so which is why my question to him and i find try to see if there is something uh, in his non fiction because there is a certain style in non fiction so th- sometimes then i wonder whether is that his uh, natural language but what is natural to you what is your uh, what is your language is there is there a language or is it uh, something it changes from play to play or how is it You know, I worked very hard. I just told you, nothing came to, except for the first play, Yayati, which came like that, and I was aghast and I wrote Yayati. After that, every play I had to, I, I was interested in. I had to say, now what next? What will I do now? Ah, now I'll write a historical play. Which one shall I write? Oh, Tugluk is a good subject. Let me work on it. So I wrote Tugluk. Now what shall I write? I'll let me write about a folk tale. You know, so from like that, like each one, I took it, worked at it, worked at the form and what is possible. And my language is also like that. Let me tell you, he knows, but for you, you see, my mother tongue is Konkani. Okay, Konkani. Um, and I grew up in Pune, where um, we all went to Marathi school. Then, at the age of about three or four. when me my elder sister my elder brother we all went to marathi school my father was sent off to sirsi and there ami and my younger sister went to a proper kannada medium school proper kannada mein. so i started sitting on the plank with boys younger than me and learning kannada so so i learned uh, kannada at school and you know became a kannada writer but the point is sirsi is in an area where kannada is how shall i put it is not really the mother tongue to anyone there you know it's it's an area which is serrated with rivers and little groups of people so the havyaks have their own kannada if you really ask them what is their mother tongue they have their own konkani has their own kannada Everyone has their own Kannada. The bunch have their own Kannada. They all speak very literary Kannada. Speak and pride themselves on we speak good Kannada. But what they speak is actually learned Kannada. Shivam Kannada asked why he didn't write a novel uh, in his mother tongue. He said if I had written it in my mother tongue, that Kannada, no one would have understood it. I came to Sirsi and then Sirsi came to Dharwa. and there i suddenly friend in dharwar i discovered what it is to have a language which can be a mother tongue 
you know, it's range, not learned from books. And Manohar Granthamalaya, all this G.B. Joshi, uh, Kirtinath Kutkut, you all spoke North Karnataka Kannada. So I taught myself that. You know, if you read my uh, uh, Talaganda, it's entirely in North Karnataka. And I think you can't find any flaw in it. It's, it's a mask, really. So right through, I kept teaching myself to write in a Kannada which was not my own. You know? And right through, there were people, as I succeeded, there were people snapping at me saying, Girish doesn't know how to write Kannada. <laughs> You know that. Huh? There was a whole school because I was successful despite my bad Kannada. So I made myself learn uh, uh, Kannada, which was not my mother tongue. Although I was an outsider and coming with no Kannada, no other Kannada man or a playwright went through the range of Kannada that I did. Yeah. In films, in plays. So I have a, at my command, or at least used in my, this uh, play, uh, range of uh, Kannadas which are really so quite surprisingly varied. So uh, so my command of Eng Kannada is in fact quite vast, if I may say so myself. Girish has this thing about his multiple Kannadas. He's aware of that and he's self conscious. We think of him as a great Kannada writer, but I suspect he betrays a certain insecurity. In his essay, which is, uh, you know, called Nanu Mattinanda Kannada, it's me and, and my Kannada. So he has uh, talked about this, about how he learned, or he doesn't use the word learned there. He says, how I made this Kannada mine. That is, that is the expression. That's great. Yeah. yeah, so he says, I made North Karnataka Kannada mine when I uh, acted in Karan's Jokumaraswami. So he said that is the that is the time when I experienced the power of that language. And he says when I did Kadu uh, film, I made that language mine, the Mysore uh, you know Al Hali language mine. And similarly, when I did Kuempu's uh, work on Kuempu's work, I made that language mine. If you are writing in, in your mother tongue, when I say mother tongue, I mean in a, in, a, in a language where you are very confident of, you tend to take certain things for granted. And it is the beauty of, of writing also. But when you, when you write in a language which, is, which, you are, you know, which you are so conscious of, then you, the effect is something different. And I think it was possible to be very effective because it is uh, he wrote plays. So if he was a novelist, uh, he could not have written novel five novels in five different languages. It is impossible to sustain uh, that kind of a thing. While it is possible in a play, uh, and also because of uh, characters, and I, I don't agree that you know that he, though he himself says my Canada was bad, but I don't uh, really uh, subscribe to it because I have enjoyed his language very much. Actually, yeah. let me see. Actually, if I had written, as I think. The base, base, the template for me would be Marathi, and then of course Konkani because it's from my first year to the fourth to the fifth year, I learnt Marathi, and at home we all spoke Marathi. Me, my brother, my sister, you know, they, they, they all read Marathi. It's only because I was in Sirsi that I learned Kannada. But at home we got Kerala's Kirsti, all these Marathi journals. For all that he says about Marathi, Girish has written some of Kannada's most iconic plays. Your favorite play, Vivek, Tughlaq. Why is it your favorite? Because uh, Azam and Aziz, yeah. because of them, play has, you know, several meanings. If they were not there, the play would not have been as powerful as it is. And which is because of them, that play is still contemporary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Azam and Aziz are these wonderful fellows. They're full of surprises. They appear throughout the play, no, Vivek, in the most unexpected places. I mean, sometimes they move the plot forward, other times they function like a chorus. Let's listen to a scene with Azam and Aziz from Tughlaq, which was published in English in 1972. This is the scene in which we are introduced to them, and it's read by Vivek Madan and Satin Gurjali. <laughs> Azam. 
Aziz? What on earth? Shh! Let, let me down. Let me down and hold your tongue. If they find out I'm finished, man. But, but, but I don't see you for years and, and then this, this? Shh! Shut up! I thought something was funny. I mean, a man wins a case against the king himself. You would expect him to come out triumphantly. I mean, holding his head high. Not hide inside. Listen, Brahmins don't carry daggers around like that. What are you doing here? I am where there is a crowd. Look, today's earnings. <laughs> and you won't believe me if I tell you where they hide their money. So your bad habits continue, do they? Not habit, occupation. Anyway, I'm just a common pickpocket. But you're up to no good either, I can see that. A Muslim dhobi can't become a Brahmin that easily. Hey, shh, for God's sake, keep your voice down. Okay, now look. If I tell you the truth, will you keep it to yourself? Hmm. Depends on what I get out of it. All right. You're an old friend. I keep quiet for nothing. So? Did you hear the royal proclamation the other day? Which one? There are so many. You know, the one on the second anniversary of his coronation. Henceforth, people may file a suit against the Sultan himself for the misbehavior of his officers. No one need have any fear. Justice will be done, and etc, etc. Well, I was at the end of my tether then. There's no future in being a dhobi these days. So, I did a bit of thinking. There is a Brahmin called Vishnu Prasad whose land had been confiscated recently. I shaved my head and went to him. I said I would buy the land. Please, 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 a little slowly. I, I, I know, you know I'm not very bright. But what's the point? I, I mean, the land was confiscated, wasn't it? Yes, exactly. That's what he said too. But I said, never mind about that. So he sold me the land, backdating the contract. And I filed my suit. <laughs> well, here I am. 500 silver dinars for nothing and a job in His Merciful Majesty's own civil service. But what if you had cut off your head instead? <laughs> anyway, why did you have to dress up in these ungodly clothes? Couldn't you have come like a proper Muslim? But then what would happen to the king's impartial justice? A Muslim plaintiff against a Muslim king? I mean, where's the question of justice there? Where's the equality between Hindus and Muslims? If, on the other hand, the plaintiff's a Hindu... Well, you saw the crowds. Mm. Complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit too subtle for you. Anyway, here's my offer. From tomorrow, I join the civil service. Why don't you come along? Huh? I'll get you a job under me. You know, a Brahmin with a Muslim friend? The Sultan will like that. No, thanks. I'm quite happy. Oh, come along. It won't be for long. I don't intend to be a Brahmin forever. There's money here and we'll make a pile by the time we reach Talatabad. And then? How should I know? You know, when I read Tughlaq in the 70s and 80s, it was so clearly about Nehru. How did you read it, Vivek? No, when I read it, I felt it was for Indira Gandhi because yeah. <laughs> yeah. much younger. Yeah. Yeah. So now if somebody reads now, you yeah. know, I'm sure they'll find plenty. Of... It's no, but I think it, Tughlaq is much more than just uh, power. Yeah. It is, yeah. it's, it's more than that. It yeah. is, uh, there, is, there is so much about uh, rule, law, yeah. God, God. And love, yeah. uh, you know, his, his desire for that. So it's, uh, it's a very complex play. I want to switch tracks here, Vivek. Tughlaq was published in Kannada in 1964, around the same time as Anantamurti Samskara. And both these works catapulted Kannada writing into a national consciousness. People began to see that something was happening in Kannada literature, something revolutionary and path-breaking. This you must note is the, the, the most important thing about Kannada literature of the 20th century is that Karnataka was broken by the British into four different languages. And there was South Canada, which came under the influence of inter, uh, missionaries, so that they produced the dictionaries Mangalore. And the Mangalore, this Mangalore port was very important. Yeah. That was the literary connection. And um, 
South Canada was the, what you might call by modern term the most progressive. Okay, they produced the most banks, printing, dictionary, you know, education, education, huh? education institutes, education and everything. A new novels, first novels came from there. It's interesting that the first Kannada novels were written by people of our community. Most regressive was Hyderabad, because Hyderabad did nothing at all, and it remained regressive. Then there was old Mysore state. Now the old Mysore state was under the thumb of the British, so they could not encourage anything that would be that might upset the British Raj. You know, so the independence moment more or less passed it by. And then there was North Karnataka. No, North Karnataka was part of the Bombay state. You know, and it's a part of the Bombay state, and it, it was contiguous with Gujarat and uh, Maharashtra, and so on. And some of it uh, worked out. And the Marathi influence on Kannada is very strong there. We get our lyrics from there, early lyrics. We get our novels from there, all that. But the different parts came together in 1956, you know, and then it, this uh, Karnataka was formed. And a new energy sparked off. And my generation, Anant Murthy's generation, we benefited from that because we came to know each other. Rick, there's the writing there, this, you know, great excitement, all that. See, 56 was an important uh, uh, year and it is because there is there is a lot behind this. It's not just a unification, uh, you know, the geographical or political, you know, it's not, there is, there is, there is a long struggle which is behind this. And the struggle is to uh, preserve this Canada. In fact, there is a very nice Bendre's uh, line which is not in this context, but I'm saying it's, it really reflects uh, the, the diversity of Kannada and what, how it must be seen. And the line is, Kannada wu Kannada wa Kannadi sutarabeku. Kannadi is, is a mirror. Yeah. So Kannada must reflect Kannada. In the mirror of Kannada, it, it means that you have a Kannada, which is, a, you know, the Mysore Kannada. There is a North Karnataka Kannada. There is, so you have to reflect in each other's mirrors. You know, Girish wrote in, I think in 62, his first play was published and then um, uh, Samskara came in 65. You know, so all these things were, were happening soon after this. And then there were other important uh, works uh, which were also happening in North Karnataka, like Ramayana, you know. Uh, so, so, but it was appreciated all across uh, Karnataka. There are so many um, articles written by each one of them on, on each other. Lankesh wrote on Anant Murthy, Anant Murthy wrote on, on Girish. Like for example, uh, Tughlaq introduction was written by uh, Anant Murthy. And then they all responded to each other. They all fought with each other. And they, they responded to each other through their works. And I feel that, you know, that really helped realize the dream of this Karnataka Eki Karana. Because it is not the political, it is not the geographical, but it is actually culturally to feel that you, you know, everything is really the part of the same Canada. How great, no, that unities can be formed around culture, that culture is more important than politics. And that's really what we've been listening to in this episode. The many ways in which plays and literature can tell us more about who we are than history or politics or sociology. We've heard Girish and Vivek Shanbagh talk about moments in Canada writing and moments in Canada culture. Girish's own many Kannadas and the many Kannadas within the state. That's why we've called this episode The Geographies of Kannada. In part two of the conversation between Girish and Vivek, we hear about Kannada's Nyanapita Awards, who Girish thought of as his community and who he considered his rivals. You have been listening to The River Has No Fear of Memories, a series of conversations with Girish Karnad. We thank the Nilekani Philanthropies for supporting this series, Pallavi MD and Konarak Reddy for the original music, Gokula Bishek, Gaurav Krishna, and the Bangalore Studio for sound recording and engineering. 
At the Bangalore International Center, our thanks to Lekha Naidu, Raghu Tenkaila, Saraswati MP, S. Sarvanna Raj, Rajashekhar B.N., Manas Sampath, and of course, V. Ravi Chandran. Ajay Krishnan, Sunil Shadbagh, Vinod Ravindran, and Vivek Madan, thank you for being there when we needed you. Thank you also, Vivek Shanbag and Shanta Gokhale. Our special thanks to the Karnad family. Anmol Tiku and myself, Arshia Satar, have put these episodes together from conversations that we had with Girish Karnad in June 2019.